Good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, a Monday night on a Tuesday night. Apologies for last night. Um, wasn't my fault. It was uh, Facebooks and Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, so we did try to do other channels like Twitter and YouTube, but apparently they're all a bit unstable. So we decided that we'll uh, postpone it till tonight. So I hope you're all well and you've got over the excitement of Saturday. And so now we will uh, now talk about Saturday to bring all the excitement back. So let's get Vic on. Good afternoon, Vic, or good evening, even, Vic. How good evening to you, Chris. How are you this evening? You okay? How Jolly you? good. Right? I think I'm okay. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Jolly good. So tonight we've got James, Anna and Rob on, and we're hoping we'll have Johnny on um, shortly as well. So he'll join us when he gets here. So, without further ado, let's bring everybody on. So, we've got James, we've got Anna, and we've got Rob. Hiya. Hiya. Hi, all. Hi, all. It seems like 24 hours since I've seen you yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, have a good one, and I will speak to you later. Chris, thank you very much indeed. And uh, if you'd like to send any comments in uh, this evening, then please feel free to do so. Uh, hopefully we are broadcasting live. I'm just checking to see that we are. Um, but if we're not, then we'll start again in a minute. So that'll be as simple as that, really. Uh, James, Rob and Anna, hello to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening again. Uh, we were all ready to go yesterday, but um, unfortunately Mr Zuckerberg hadn't solved the problem on Facebook uh, until uh, we were due to go live. Uh, James, how are you? Very good, thanks, Vic. Anna, how are you? Yeah, very good. Top class today. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, good. Rob, how are you? Tickety boo, mate. Nothing better than three points at the weekend against a local rival. Absolutely. Well, it's all oh, Chris is going to. I'm us. just came back. It's a bit weird. We've got five mm. viewers, um, but people are saying they can't see us. So mm. um, yeah, yeah. I, just, I just check, check Facebook, and it's not. Uh, the it's normal. not on yet. No. no. Although it's not live. It did come up on mine and then it's disappeared yeah. again. So um, I don't know if anybody in the comments, if you can, anybody in the comments can say if uh, you actually can see anything. Um, nope. So no, it doesn't, doesn't sure. appear to be. It might it's be since I done it yesterday when it was down. I don't know. Um, it's saying we're live. I don't know. If you end the broadcast, that means you can't start it again, doesn't it? Uh, no, we no, yes, that's true. We can't. So, yeah, it's, Pete's just come on here. It's weird. It looks live. We're we're live on the system. Um, but it's not on Facebook, is it? When I go on Facebook, it's uh, no. It says it says you are live, but then it's uh, we're not. Okay, let me have a look. Oh, right. Jamie um, is seeing us all. Carol, Alan, Shane and Roy are all seeing us. So let's carry on. I will leave you to it. And uh, OK, we're we recording anyway, are we? We're recording uh, anyway. So. Yeah. OK. Right. Well, we'll carry on then. Um, regardless, I think it's fair to say. Uh, let's talk about Saturday then. Obviously, um, a, a victory at uh, the Mem. James, your thoughts on it? It was a wet Saturday afternoon, uh, but it turned out to be a very pleasurable one in the end. Yeah, no, it was a good experience. I think um, mm -hmm. first half was, uh, I think I thought the first 15, 20 minutes, I was like, mm, I'm not sure how this is going to go today. But I think, um, uh, you know, the second half was outstanding, wasn't it? I think um, the manager said it was one of the best performances. Um, and that final goal was amazing, I think, really. And McCurdy came on and basically changed the whole game, really, didn't he? Um, you know, that fresh impetus, his energy and, and passion and, you know, just, yeah, it was outstanding. I, I was chuffed, I have to say. And I think um, pretty much all 700 uh, away fans, certainly where I was sat anyway, were as well. So, yeah, very good. Anna, your thoughts on it? Uh, you couldn't you couldn't have hoped or wished for better, really, could you? I think, uh, you know, when you when you when you think that you had Joey Bond, pantomime villain on the touchline, you've got Garner returning to his uh, old haunt where he got sacked and wasn't very highly thought of. You've got uh, an ex striker in Pittman who clearly would have wanted to score against us. It's lashing it down with rain. Uh, first half, we're one nil down. Second half, absolutely brilliant stuff. 
And as uh, James said, McCurdy came on and changed the game. But you couldn't couldn't really. It was all set up so beautifully um, for for a, for a win like that, really. And we turned it, turned it around, and uh, especially after four game winless run as well. But uh, brilliant stuff, absolutely. Yeah. Thoroughly yeah, brilliant. Rob. There was a sending off as well, of course, which had a bearing on it, wasn't there? But um, you know, let's take nothing away from the overall victory. I mean, the first half, I've got to say, it wasn't great, was it? It was kind of a bit stale, to be honest. And you wondered where it was going to come from the goal. And as we've mentioned, Harry McCurdy comes on, and it's like, wow, the world's changed. And then we bring another one on, Johnny Williams. You know, his pace is frightening. And and if you're a defender in the latter stages of a wet, slippery game at the Mem, you're thinking, what on earth is going on here? Well, as it proved, didn't it? I mean, it was uh, it was just in a couple of inspired substitutions that made a, a huge difference to the complexion of the game. I have to say, I, I know there was it was a little bit downbeat first half, but the performance-wise, Swindon dominated possession, just didn't look like they'd score a goal. So performance-wise, I'm sure um, the guys at half-time would have sat down and thought, we've done OK, but where's our goals going to come from? And we were all having that same discussion, weren't we, at half-time? But as you say, those, those substitutions, McCurdy was... Maverick, just a, a breath of fresh air, just came off the bench and, and ran them ragged. And as you say, when you can bring on a, a proven Welsh international who's uh, who's just you know he's, he's, he's still at the peak of his career to to add to what you've already got, um, it was just a, a fabulous second half performance. And ironically, we've all been talking about what happens if Tyree Simpson gets injured. Of course, they took Tyree Simpson off, and suddenly Swindon became a completely different team with McCurdy taking up that role. At, in the, in the middle of the forward line. So I'm, I'm sure we can't do that every week, but we've suddenly seen that there is an alternative if we need it. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because many people have said about Ben Garner not having a plan B. Well, we had a plan B Saturday. I know you were going to say. Well, yeah, yeah. I was just just going just gonna to add to that, that when, when McCurdy's number was held up uh, to, to come on, I, I had one moment of, well, hold on a minute, Simpson leads the line. But then actually, first half, he wasn't able to impose himself physically on the game at all, was he? For whatever reason, no. and I, I thought at that moment, you know, why, why the hell not, really? And and that's, I think, why it worked because Simpson's physical presence was not missed. And no. actually, McCurdy, when he came on, they, they didn't have to play him. He was he was unplayable for them because he was that maverick figure, as you said, and he just twinkle toed his way around the defence. So that, that's why I think it worked. I'm not sure yeah. it always worked. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, actually, just, just to add to that as well. Um, everyone that was sat around or stood around me ultimately was saying no one wants to pass uh, to Simpson. Um, that's what they just kept on saying all the time. You could see, and I, I don't know whether they've, I don't know whether some players have last, la kind of, I don't know, lacking confidence in Simpson's hold-up ability or what, but literally they had the opportunity to pass to him in the first half and just didn't. They So I think that's probably why he came off because, you know, when he did get the ball, he didn't do very well in terms of holding it up and doing what he should have done. And secondly, a lot of players didn't seem to want to pass to him. So it was just the game was kind of passing him by largely, I think. Yeah, it's, um, this is a. Uh, I had a tweet earlier uh, over the weekend when we first publicised this. This is from Pete Marsh. Hello to you, Pete. Red slipper, man of the match, obviously, I think is referring to uh, Harry McCurdy. Uh, Pink White Fronts Award for worst performer of the game, Brett Pittman. That goes back to the uh, Zav Austin uh, Pink White Fronts appearance of a few weeks ago. <laughs> I look ahead to Forest Green as well. Backup goalie, what's Camp doing? Lewis Ward, Rob Hunt and McCurdy to start. Jordan Lydon on the bench. Lots to discuss there. I think we all agree that Harry McCurdy probably is up there for man of the match. I know on the supporters bus, Rob, he won by street, I think, didn't he? So um, um, I know, Ali, you kind of thought um, Ben Gladwin might have got that. Uh, yeah, for me, you know, Gladwin is 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 much maligned. He, he's that player, and you can hear folks around you, as soon as Gladwin comes on the pitch, they're having a go at him. I don't really understand that. I, I think you're confusing his languid style for laziness. And for me, he gives everything to this club, and he always has done. Um, second half, I thought he was he was brilliant, uh, doubling up. You know, his, his role is so hard. He's he's at once supposed to be a holding player and to move the ball forward in the absence of Grant. And you can't leave Louis, Lewis Reed on his own. So he's trying to cover the holding role, and he's trying to play the ball, ball forward. I thought he was brilliant second half, to be honest. And I was so happy for him, that he, and for us as well, that he put that penalty away. So for me, he was uh, definitely a candidate for man of the match. 
just to say we, we might be having one or two issues so uh and we are recording this so hopefully with a bit of luck we can put it out later if it's not going out live so um all sorts of things and problems with facebook i think it's fair to say uh right what about backup goalkeepers then rob uh lewis ward uh, has had a couple of games this season uh one in the um carabao cup one in the efl trophy obviously extra fans rated him very highly what are your thoughts well, look, I think obviously everyone's going to turn their attentions to Forest Green and everyone's going to focus on the players we haven't got. But this is a real opportunity. And this is a real opportunity for several of those players. We've, we've talked about McCurdy already and what an impact he had from the bench. We've not seen it from the start with McCurdy yet. He's had a couple of games early doors where he never really set the world on fire. So big opportunity for him. And similarly, we talk about Lewis Ward. I, I, I don't think any of us really thought that Jojo Watercott would have the, the season he's had so far. He's just been outstanding. And that probably, um, it pops Lewis Ward further down the pecking order than probably we all thought he would be at the start of the season. I thought it would be quite a close battle between the two and we might see them chopping and changing week after week. So I've got every confidence in Lewis Ward. I think as a goalkeeper, what we've seen so far, and as you say, in terms of his reputation, he's a big physical presence. You need that as a goalkeeper. He can. He's a shot stopper as well. I've got no concerns about him being in goal at Forest Green on Saturday. James, uh, I would agree actually with Rob completely. I thought um, I, I've actually seen him play a few times before before he joined us. Um, he always looked very competent. Um, I think the only thing he's not maybe as good at uh, as Woolacott is his distribution. If I'm honest, um, I think sometimes his kicking can be a little bit um, a bit kind of inconsistent, um, but. I think from a pure goalkeeping perspective, um, you know, I don't have any issues at all. I think um, I think we're really lucky to have two great goalkeepers, really. I, I would have no no concerns about either one of them being in goal, really, at all. So, Anna? Yeah, no concerns around goalkeeper. I mean, I, I thought when Garner's been asked about the, the situation a couple of times, I think his, his response is really... Um, you know, really quite clever that he's 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 saying, let's just get on with it. You know, we go into every game as, as if we want to win the game. If players aren't available, players aren't available. It gives others opportunities. Let's just get on with it. And uh, and you know, he doesn't he doesn't try and doesn't try and hide the fact he's he doesn't try and say he's disappointed. Just get on with it. And I think that's dead right. Um, have we got a chance? Well, yeah, I think it's an opportunity for those for those second string players to come up and show what they're worth. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I think it's interesting, Rob, we were having a chat last night about McCurdy. Should he start or not start? I mean, I think my view is similar to yours. I mean, to bring him on with half an hour left is ideal. But it, I, I assume he might be starting on Saturday. Well, I mean, every player wants to start, don't they? Nobody wants to be recognised as the super sub who comes on and changes the game. But you just look at the way that... Um, you look for when you come off the bench, you look for impact, don't you? That's the first thing you focus on. What is going to change the game? What have you got on the bench that could turn around and turn a, a defeat into a victory or a draw into a win, or maybe even a defeat into a draw, whatever it might be, just to just to change the game. And I don't think you'll find anyone better than that in this division than Harry McCurdy. But obviously, as we said before, he wants to be a starter. Everyone wants to be a starter. So now he's got to prove it from the start. He's going to come up against fullbacks and centre backs who are going to be in the prime of their conditioning as well, which maybe not would not be the case sixty five minutes into a game. Um, so let's see how he can how he changes the game this time around from the start. It's high profile. It's on the television, as we all know, and players of that ilk who we've had before tend to revel in those situations where the uh, the cameras might be on them and they can they can show the world how good they really are. And it won't just be McCurdy, will it? It will be, we've talked about all the players who might get opportunities that may not necessarily be automatic starters. Well, you can put yourself right in the the, uh, the shop window, so to speak, can't you, if, you're, uh, if you play superbly well on television. So opportunities for everybody on Saturday, I'd say. James, one name that's been missing, of course, over recent weeks is A. Grant. Um, I, I think Ben Garner's saying it's a to try to keep consistency within the squad. And you can kind of understand that because he'd be back for one game, then missing for another few. And obviously with the quarantine <clears throat> issues as well, it, it's not great for a squad. I, I, a lot of people would say we missed Grant, but obviously on Saturday we won 3-1 away from home. So it's an interesting one, isn't it? 
it, it is. I think we have missed Grant in our earlier games. I don't think we necessarily missed him on Saturday, but certainly um, some of the home games are, you know, I think we definitely missed him. Um, it's interesting, actually. <laughs> um, I'm not a Man United fan, but I was listening to Alex Ferguson um, or some comments he made where, where today he was saying, you know, obviously there's been a lot of who are about um, uh, Ronaldo being left on the bench the other night for Man United. Um, and Ferguson said you should all start with your best team. Um, if they're available, start with your best team, you know, in the league. Um, and I tend to agree with that, really. I, I, I kind of understand a little bit why, you know, he wants to try and get a... Uh, Garner wants to get a consistent team week on week. But, you know, we've got quite a small squad, so it's... You know, there's, there's going to be injuries, suspensions, obviously international duty, etc. So you're going to have to make changes. And I, I, I still think, you know, he's one of our best players. And if he's available, he should start personally. I understand, you know, the week he came back probably wasn't, you, you know, he was still su suffering jet lag, tiredness, whatever it was, obviously having, you know, probably a bit of a fitness issue as well, having been um, kind of not been able to kind of leave the house or whatever for a while. But, you know, he was allegedly, he, he was available, fit and everything else this weekend. And, possibly, you know, he should have played, I think, really. That's, that's okay. my idea. Yeah. Uh, this is Jason, Anna. Uh, disagree slightly with Anna. Gladwin was missing in the first half, much better in the second half. But I think you kind of made that point, didn't you? His second half performance yeah. was much better yeah. than his first. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Go on. No, I mean, each to their own opinion, right? Yeah, that's what football is. Game of opinions. Uh, this is from Jack. We should have signed a new striker in the summer. I know Simpson's only 19, but he's the reason we haven't been scoring goals. Slightly unfair, I'd say, on him, uh, which is the reason we're drawing games, not winning them. He's got three goals, I think, this season, and hasn't he? And, you know, there's been a lot on young shoulders, that burden of playing on his own up front. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think probably possibly... Every single fan is saying this, you know, why aren't we playing two up front? Why didn't we sign a striker with a bit of nous to get alongside Simpson and give him a bit of coaching? Um, but the reality is we didn't. Uh, Garner said from that point, I think, at the end of the transfer window that, look, we've got plenty of attacking options. They're not, they're not forwards, maybe, but we have got a lot of forward attacking midfielders. Um, and, and Simpson is, is learning and developing all the time. It didn't work out for him on Saturday. It will work out for him with other games. Um, and I think almost, you know, when, when we do attack and when the game suits him, you know, we are getting bodies alongside him. And that's going to be the, the crucial thing to scoring goals is support around him when we go forward. Uh, and I think that was what happened second half, right, albeit without Simpson on Saturday, was that, um, you know, we got bodies forward, didn't we? I mean, there was Conroy crossing the ball at one point. We got a lot of players into the box, and, and that that's what's going to get us goals. So it's not just about Simpson. No, no, I agree with you. Um, Rob, this is uh, from Pete. Was it really a penalty on Saturday? Wouldn't we have been furious if that was given against us? And a booking too seemed very harsh. Uh, basically, are we getting too uh, carried away with Saturday? Hmm, interesting. I well, I got very carried away with Saturday. I don't <laughs> care uh, really, uh, but. Um, it was really difficult to see from behind the goal, wasn't it? I mean, it was a very quick incident. If you're a defender, can you get your hand out of the way? I mean, looking at it again, even more difficult to get your hand out of the way because, what, you're talking about a yard away? You know, so yeah. was it harsh or not? A couple of things for me. Um, one is, does it stop the ball from going in the goal? Yes, is the answer. And it did hit an arm. So for me, it's a penalty just because of that reason. OK, you can always argue the case of distance between ball and and hand and could he have actually got it out of the way well the hand when you see it again in slow motion is not right next to his arm it's out a little bit well, not next to his body it's out a little bit and because of that for me it's a penalty it's the double jeopardy rule when it comes to bookings isn't it and uh, mm. obviously that one we can't do too much about I don't think any of us were calling for him to be sent off we were just calling for the penalty um, so happened in our favor this time it might happen against us Another day, I watched a game on Sunday morning where uh, my boy gave away a penalty for handball five minutes into stoppage time, um, and he had his hand right next to his, his body. So believe me, there's a, you see these things change at all levels of football. Um, but I, I, I have to say, I think I saw it again 
in slow motion afterwards and you've got to credit and i don't do this very often you absolutely have to credit the referee he had the perfect view yeah, he would have sure. been anywhere else around that penalty area he'd have either had a body in the way or he wouldn't have got a clear view at all but it was absolutely line of sight and immediately gave the penalty so credit to the referee we're very harsh on them sometimes but he got that one absolutely spot on yeah he pointed it straight to the spot didn't he um James, the penalty then. I mean, we wanted a player on tonight to talk about the game, but unfortunately, we haven't had a player on this season. I'm not going to get too annoyed about it, but um, it would be nice to get a player on occasionally, wouldn't it, football club? Anyway, uh, James, the penalty then. I mean, Gladwin's under a lot of pressure, isn't he? Um, And it was almost the perfect penalty, wasn't it? Placed right in the corner. Keeper had no chance. Yeah, I was slightly nervous, although it was great to get the penalty. With obviously um, our first choice penalty taker having gone off, I was thinking, oh, who's going to take the penalty? And, and when I saw Gladwin, I thought, oh, no, because, you know, he is quite, um, he comes across, I think, as Anna's already said, as kind of quite um, chilled out, you know, kind of, his kind of demeanour is quite, um, it's quite like that. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I really hope he scores. But I think, yeah, it was, it was almost, the near, you know, it was right in the corner. The goalkeeper obviously went the right way, but he, you know, he didn't get to it properly because I think the pace on the ball and the position right in the corner was was pretty spot on. So, yeah, it was it was it was great. Um, I think that I, I agree with you. I don't necessarily always um, uh, agree with some of the ref the quality of the referees we get in our league, but I think he got I think he got the penalty spot on to be honest. Um, and you could see, you know, although he did give it straight away, he did he did give himself a few seconds to. Yeah, think. he did. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did. Yeah. And, and he was pretty, you know, pretty kind of agreed that it was it was a penalty, and you know, kind of then gave it. And I think I think it's only fair. I, I agree with Rob that you know, ultimately, if it's stopping the ball going in the net, it should be a penalty. But I think the problem we've got in football is lack of consistency, haven't we, across all leagues? Because you you, you see the same instant in in another league, um, you know, on another day with another referee, and he wouldn't give it. Um, and you know, I, I guess it comes down to the human uh, the human mind, and uh, you know that. Different, different people's interpretations, but um, for me, it was a penalty. So yeah, yeah. Jason says, was there any motion from hand to ball? It was a little harsh. I, I, if anybody can explain the handball rule to me, I'd be grateful. I mean, it, it's a bit akin to getting petrol from one side of the country to another. It seems to me quite a difficult thing to sort out. Uh, I just don't understand how it's a handball or it isn't a handball, you know, should we just go to the point where, and you know, any, anything that touches the hand in the penalty box is a penalty area. I, I you know, to me, it's really uh, difficult to understand. But they, they've tried that, haven't they? That, you know, that any, any handball in the area. And I, and I don't personally agree with that. I mean, you've seen some absolute shocking decisions that, that, that have been highlighted on match of the day in the last 12, 12 plus months. Where, where there's been no intent, no movement, and they've given a penalty. I'm not in favour of those sort of penalties, to be honest. Um, I couldn't tell you whether it was a, whether it was a penalty or not Saturday. Um, I was right behind the goal, so I couldn't didn't mm. have a great great angle on it, to be honest. Um, but uh, the, the you know the fact the fact is that probably we were going to score anyway. We had that momentum building, um, and whether or not they had ten men on the pitch or eleven men. In actual fact, they almost started with ten because. If you could have asked for something from an ex-striker in Pittman, you got exactly that, didn't you? Which was absolutely nothing. <laughs> so you know, we, we were we were, we were going to score. We were going to score anyway. And the sucker punch came a couple of minutes after that when McCurdy tapped in the uh, loose ball from the keeper. So hence yeah. the um, pink white uh, white front uh, award for the worst player of the game. I mean, he really annoyed think... for the game. Did you have you did you hear what he said before the game? They uh, they they gave it on the radio. Uh, he was in, he was interviewed um and basically said that the, the, you know Swindon was obviously the club was a was a mess last season um and you know and he 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 he, he it appears that things have been sorted out with the, with the purchase and what have you but he's and, and then i think he was asked um you know what his views on that were and he said i don't really care to be honest and that really annoyed me because the fact is you know he was one of the people that didn't come back went on strike at the beginning yeah. of the season because his wages weren't paid um you know, he obviously didn't give a two hoots about the club, and you know the fact yeah. that he was ineffective and looked like he was slower this season than he was last season, which I didn't think was possible. Um, wow. you know, I mean, <laughs> but, uh, from my perspective, he got what he deserved, really. <laughs> yeah, to, I, I, we, 
We listen to um, I, I take take some interest in listening to the local radio driving away from an away fixture. Uh, so listen to Jerry Barton's interview, and he wasn't greatly um, in praise of Pittman. Let's say I think one of the questions that was put to him was, "How do you play with such an un- immobile striker?" <laughs> Which was exactly that, wasn't it? We knew, we knew that when Pittman went, and I I'm so happy that they took him. Yeah, I think I said to you at half time well, when he went off, Rob, did he actually touch the ball in the game? And I. I can't actually remember him having any impact whatsoever. And just before you answer that, the, the McCurdy goal, seconds before that, Martin Smith, who's appeared on this panel before, said to me, it'd be great if we got a third goal now, wouldn't it? Bang. <laughs> well, there's the third goal. So great prophecy from Martin Smith. But I, I, I couldn't remember him touching the ball or having any impact in it whatsoever. I think he won one free kick early in the, uh, early in the piece when Odemeyer went over the top of him. Uh, and from that point onwards, not not seen him. I mean, if you've got ball playing centre halves, you must have a dream of a day when you've got Brett, Brett Pittman on the opposition side. You know he's not going to close you down. You've got all day long to try and pick your passes, and obviously that suits the the, the absolute style that uh, Garner wants to play with his team. And with with Conroy and uh, at the back, you know you've got real passing ability. So you do need somebody to get in their faces and stop them from playing. And it was absolutely the wrong game plan from Joey Barton. I, I chuckle at it now. If you think about Brett Pittman last season, we saw um, what he can do if you put the ball in the box, in around a six-yard box. He will still score you gold and he will still be a threat, even though he can't run anymore if or he couldn't can. run at all. Yeah. Um, he's, he will still score you goals and he still scored goals last season for us. Didn't get too many, but he still scored goals. But... Um, no, if you're expecting him to be running the channels and running the line uh, to, to try and get himself into the uh, into the centre forward position, not going to happen anymore, I'm afraid. Those those days are long gone if they ever existed at all. No. Um, so final thoughts on Saturday then. I mean, I, I, it's very easy. We're fifth in the league and it's very easy to come away from that thinking, great, you know, this is, this is a fantastic win. It's the launch pad. We're away. Um and, you know, we're going to storm up the league now. Uh, it's a bit like Scunthorpe on the opening day. It's not quite going to be like that, James, is it? There's a long hard season to go starting this Saturday. But your final thoughts on Saturday and reflections. I, I mean, I'm <laughs> my benchmark is always Plymouth away on that New Year's Day, which is just magnificent. Northampton away, the final away game that we saw uh, before COVID. And Saturday was pretty much up there. It was a great day, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I think I said you, said to you before the game when we met up, Vic, that um, you know that 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 Plymouth game on New Year's Day was an absolutely amazing game, and yeah, it kind of um, you know the atmosphere of that game was amazing. We played really well, obviously we won, um, but I think um, yeah, ultimately you know that game on Saturday came fairly close. Obviously, it wasn't quite as raucous atmosphere because there wasn't as many people there. Plus, the weather was atrocious, which I think kind of. Um, to some extent, uh, probably reduce the amount of uh, singing from the town fans as you probably normally get because they were drenched. But um, it was still a pretty good atmosphere, and um, yeah, and it was it was it was a great day. It really was. And like I said to you earlier, the sausage rolls were pretty good as well. So that's always good in my eyes. Yeah, cheese and onion pasty, molten uh, is all I can say. Uh, Anna, uh, what about you? I mean, it was a great day, wasn't it? And um, you know that that moment, the third goal goes in, and you just think this is. You know, we suffered a lot last season, not seeing football. But that moment was what you got a football for, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it turns it turns into after the second goal from we might win to we've won, which is you know that that's the great moment. But it is it, let's enjoy it for what it was. Um, we do need to rein rein in the enthusiasm a little bit in terms of what it means for the whole season. And I think probably you know Saturday is going to be a completely different game, and I'm sure. We're going to talk about that in a moment, but let's just enjoy it for what it was. It was a great, great day out. I really enjoyed it. As everyone, it is what we go for, Rob, isn't it? That moment, you know that that those. I mean, let's be honest. As Swindon fans, we we, you know, we're darn miserable most of the time. But you know, those joyous occasions like Saturday, those are the moments where you go every week, aren't they? Uh, Absolutely, and they don't come. The fact that they don't come round all the time make them all the more special, don't they? When they happen, and you tend to remember them more. I mean, but. And it's right in what she says. It's it's not going to shape the season. It's three points at the end of the day. It's no more than that. But to all of us who were there on the day, it feels a lot more than that, just because we haven't experienced that 
um, sort of emotion for a little while. And it just brought all those emotions flooding back from um, derbies that we've won in the past. And it's so great to share those moments with everybody else on days like it, when you know that you're in amongst friends and whatnot, and you're, you're playing your, your local rivals, you've got the, the spoils at the end of the day, and you're going to thoroughly enjoy it. And it was a pig of a journey in terrible weather, and you get there, and you you know it's pretty rubbish. And then that away stand is never great. I have to say, <laughs> it's never great to be in, but it's much better than standing on the terraces. So you know, fair play. Uh, right, this from Pete. Ten games in, uh, a quarter of the season gone. Looks really promising, but these international games and lots of players are going to cost us points. James, I, I'm I'm not a fan of international weekends. I have to say, I just think. You know, it can disrupts the flow of the football season. Years ago, of course, they never used to have international breaks. They'd play in the internationals in midweek and then they'd come back on a Saturday play for their clubs. Are you a fan of international breaks or not? Um, I think I think there's a couple of things to say there. One is, I think it's amazing that we've got so many players actually on international mm. duty yep. for a League Two club. It shows that, you know, we are doing well as a team. Um, I don't think I've ever known us League Two club have so many players on international duty. Where actually we're moaning about the fact that you know we'd rather have a game postponed. I mean, I can't remember the last time I was against, to be honest. But I think I do feel that if we're not careful with the amount of international games that are played now, with all different numbers of competitions, that it could come back and and really hurt us at the end of the season. Especially if we carry on with the form we're in, and that you know the number of players being you know four or five players being out every every international game. I mean, ultimately, we could have postponed the game, but because it's on Sky Sports, um, we only had a couple of players, literally, that were um, called up initially. So Ghana made a decision that he didn't want to call the game off. But then we had a couple of late players kind of pulled, uh, called up, um, at which point, because the game was on Sky Sports, they had no choice. They had to play it. Um, they had you know, they had a timeline that they needed to um, to kind of uh, ask for the game to be postponed, and we were already over that. So we had to go ahead with the game. That's the reason why we weren't able to postpone it. If it hadn't been on Sky Sports, we could have postponed it probably um, a lot later. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I kind of wish that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, that we could put out our strongest team. Um, so in an ideal world, it would have been postponed, I think, this weekend to allow us to, to put out our strongest team. But my, my, yeah, like I said, my worry is that it will, especially with a small squad, in League Two, it will start hurting us if we, you know, if we keep on losing four or five players. Um, otherwise, we'll end up with a batch of fixtures that are postponed, and they'll need to play those in a relatively short period of time, and which is another problem in itself when you've got a small squad as well. So, um, yes, there's positives and negatives, I think, to it really. If I'm honest. Yeah, Anna. What about international weekends? Yeah, I mean, James has kind of covered it, really. Um, it feels sort of like we haven't almost recovered from the previous international break because obviously Grant hasn't been back in back in the matchday squad. And, and here we go again, and we're losing more players than we did last time. So um, we obviously would want to go to Forest Green with a, a full squad, but we're not going to. We've got to get on with it. Um, and I hope that I had a bit of a look actually at where the where the teams are playing. So I think Ghana, Ghana are in Zimbabwe for their second game, which is on the Tuesday or Wednesday, which is on the on our red list. Mm. So presumably that means that Wollacott coming back has got a quarantine for ten days. So he's going to be out for an additional game or possibly two. You count the uh, Papa John's. So um, you know, it is what it is. We've got to get on with it, haven't we? Rob. Uh, two two things to add, I think, from my side of things. I, I, I really hate the inconsistency of this. The very nature of the fact that the biggest clubs in our country can get games called off at the drop of a hat and they uh, they already have their fixtures um, running around the, uh, the international break. They never have to postpone games. And teams at our level um, automatically have matches put into their, their schedule for those weekends, I think there's the real smacks of inconsistency for me, and I don't like that at all. But added to that and compound it just a little bit further, we see players come back from some of these fixtures who were in the championship, and they don't have to quarantine afterwards, and they don't have to miss games afterwards. And we get Anthony Grant, and suddenly he's, he's, he's effectively missed a whole month of football as a direct result of this. And it, it, it really does smack to me of, of, again, just trying to kick the small clubs down the road a little bit further and, and let's all pander to the, to the big clubs once again. I guess the counter-argument to that is 
you don't get exposure on the television very often. This is your opportunity to do it because it's an international weekend. They do focus on the lower league clubs. And we've obviously got the benefit of a little bit of cash coming in the door because of Sky Sports deciding that they want to televise our fixture this weekend. But for me, it's the inconsistency. I really don't like it. Yeah, it's on at the Legends Lounge, I think, isn't it? Uh, they're opening the Legends up uh, for the game on Saturday. Um, right, uh, before we get on to Saturday, one or two issues, side issues, really. And we were talking before we started this, bottle tops. Now, I, I know it's something that drives people crazy. And, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is you buy a, a soft drink or, or whatever it is at a ground with a bottle top on, and then you have to have the bottle top taken off for a reason I still don't quite understand. Uh, I suppose it's to stop it being a missile. Um, but you can apparently get smoke bombs and take them inside the ground. That's a problem, it seems to me. Uh, James, what's your view on this? Uh, and, you know, there is a way around it, which several people do apparently carry shh, bottle tops in their pockets and then put them on the bottles. Um, what's your view on it? Should it? I mean, you understand the reasons, but it makes life a little difficult, to be fair, doesn't it? Uh, it, it, it does, certainly when they take your... Um, well, we, we, none of us were searched on, as we mentioned before the, um, before we came on, on online, none of us were searched on Saturday, which was surprising, I think. Um and you know we could have taken anything in you know smoke bombs as you said Vic anything really you know that could have caused real damage or harm to someone um but yeah you know um we get our bottle tops taking off us um which to be honest if I could throw a bottle top that far to hit a player given the fact they're so light I you know I'd be quite pleased um I would never get be that accurate but um it does seem crazy and I think I, I think a lot of it um in, in the past when we've had bottles or plastic bottles or, or bottle tops taken off us. Um, I remember going to Wembley, Wiz Swindon, years and it was quite a few years ago, obviously now, the, the new Wembley. Um, and, you know, they, um, they they took your bottle off you because they said it was uh, it could be used as a missile before you went into the game. Um, and then yet, yet you could buy one when you went into the stadium for about six quid for a bottle of water, yeah. which had yeah. a bottle top, bizarrely. So it was yeah. obviously a revenue uh, element that they wanted to, sting you for more money but i think um in in this instance yeah I, I think it's ridiculous personally um you know it's it it yeah i don't see what damage you can do i mean you could take in you know i had a, i had some key i had some car keys in my pocket i had a mobile phone in my pocket okay i wouldn't throw my mobile phone at anyone but you could you could put up you know you could throw something a lot heavier and probably that you would be able to hit someone with and more so than a bottle top and cause injury so it just seems ridiculous to me you know really ridiculous Anna? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i a proponent of uh, not removing the bottle tops. I think you're trying to solve a problem which isn't there at the moment. Um, I think that was illustrated partly, you know, if we go back to what happened at Stevenage, it wasn't bottles they were throwing, it was something else. So I, I think it just seems overly petty. And when I see somebody struggling up the steps of the Don Rogers with three bottles in their arms without lids, it's just, I just think it's ridiculous, to be honest. I think you've got to just let us have the tops, please. Yeah, and actually, as has been pointed out many times, Rob, the bottle top is something that you pay for. and It's part of the bottle with the stuff in it, isn't it? So, you know, as has been pointed out many times to us, the price should be reduced if the bottle top is removed. Our new crusade has started, I think, tonight, hasn't it? Our <laughs> crusade to get bottle tops back on bottles once again. I mean, I, I, it's it's a sledgehammer to crack in that situation, isn't it? I mean, if we think back to to Bristol Rovers, and and quite rightly so, they were allowing in people with umbrellas. Well, that could do an awful lot more damage than a than a bottle top. And let's be honest, the the pasties that they did, how nice they were. You throw one of them, that'll do a lot more damage than a than a, a bottle top will. So, um, no, I I I just think it it really is childish, to be honest. It's almost as if. They're trying to do the minimum they possibly can to prevent there being any kind of, of aggravation in the ground. And it just causes more disquiet amongst supporters. I just don't understand it in one, one shape or form. You throw one of those passes at a player, would have melted them, quite frankly, wouldn't it? <laughs> it, was so, it was so hot. Uh, um, and another thing, uh, toilets, James, this is a big issue. And, and I have to say the Rovers ones on Saturday were, well, how can we put this? 
not very COVID compliant, were they? Let's be honest. And, you know, we I know we're used to fo toilets at football grounds everywhere being pretty disgusting. But in this day and age, with so many health issues going on, you would think that football clubs now might take them seriously. Yeah, I, I personally I think there's only one word for it, Vic. And that's shocking, really, to be honest. Um, you know, it, it, if you can't provide, you know, decent toilets and sanitizer and soap and what have you for people to wash their hands you know when you've got 700 people ultimately in a stand it, you know you're asking for trouble i mean it's just crazy and yeah they they, they were some of the worst toilets i've you know port i think i've ever come across and they weren't particularly clean um even at the beginning of the match to be fair to be fair so um you know i think yeah i mean let's be honest some of these smaller grounds um, the away end is always the worst. You know, we, we we always end up with the worst facilities, whether it be catering or toilets or whatever it was. You know, um, so it, it doesn't surprise me that the away fan is the one that suffers. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to see what the, the home fan toilets were like. Not that I'm going to write a book on the quality of uh, football toilets because I think that would well, be cool. it might be a bestseller. To be fair, it, it might be. I could, I could go around rating them all, but. Yeah. Um, I think um, I, I bet you the home uh, the toilets had sanitizer and soap in them. So um, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty, sh pretty shocking to be honest. I think you know they, they should really look at that as a, as, a, as a bare minimum. Okay, I can I can understand you know only having one catering facility and you having to queue up for twenty minutes to get your pasty. Not that it's great, but you know because they've only got one person behind the counter. You know we kind of experience that in most away games when we go. But um, you know t based on what we've had with COVID and everything else, just general cleanliness for those toilets and sanitizer and stuff was just awful really really awful so yeah it wasn't good at all many might remember the old layer road when there was only literally one toilet at the away end it was shocking uh and uh, i mean you know i i, I the ladies talk, I, I i don't want, i don't know what to say here but you know generally speaking uh, I, I, i've seriously not been in them um but they are pretty bad aren't they I don't think the ladies' toilets are particularly any better than the men's. Uh, obviously, you have slightly different issues, uh, the men's toilets versus women's. On Saturday, we were sharing porter cabins and porter loos, weren't we? So there, there wasn't a, a dis distinction between female and, and male toilets. Um, I've seen some pretty pretty poor ones in my time supporting, supporting swimming up and down the country. Uh, and I just wonder what the regulations are around, you know, this kind of sanitation at, at sports grounds. I can't believe there isn't something, uh, you know, if you if you think about the legality of, of toilets in restaurants, for example, is there not something similar regulating that sort of facility at, at football clubs? I think there should be because it's not it's not acceptable, is it? And as James said, particularly in this time frame at the moment where people are concerned about health and, and need to be washing hands and, and so forth. It's just it's just ridiculous, really. Yeah, I remember the um, the ladies' toilets at Portsmouth away end, which um, didn't have a door on. They had clear plastic strips, which you know <laughs> is not ideal, to be fair, is it, uh, Rob? I mean, I you know I, I mentioned the old away end at Colchester, which was shocking to, to say the least. You know, I mean, we're in twenty twenty one for goodness' sake. You know, all right, in the sixties, you kind of expected toilets to be disgusting, but we have kind of moved on a bit, haven't we? We have. I think. Um, I think there is a there's a quality versus a quantity issue here, isn't there? I think when it comes to what your regulations are, I think most clubs um, in the situation that Bristol Rovers are in are making sure that they're doing the minimum compliance, which is make sure you get enough cubicles there that would allow you to open the ground under health and safety conditions, and we'll do no more than that. But I think we've all we've all grown up a little bit in the last 18 months, haven't we? And we've all realised quite how important cleanliness is. And if we think back to the bigger issues in the world at the moment and the situation going on um, with the safety of women and all things along these lines, football clubs have to take a lead with things like this. It, it's really important to, to people who go to football now. It's not just a case of sitting in the stand and supporting your team. You, you are gauging the quality of all of the facilities that are on show and when something lets you down um you will certainly then um, talk about it as we're doing right now and uh, it's right we should it, we should yeah. make things clear to everybody when when standards are not at the level that you'd expect 
This is from Pete. I remember a way at Portsmouth where you walk into the toilets, but it was just a U-shaped wall with no roof. I remember at Swansea's old vetch field, oh, there, were, there were no lights in the toilet either. It was disgusting. And, you know, it, it was literally a wall. It was that simple, really. Uh, from Jamie, I remember an away game where a steward took the plastic straw off the kid's orange juice carton before handing it back to him. That's a lot of good, isn't it? A little shitty <laughs> hole that he... <laughs> <laughs> obviously a small child with a plastic straw could cause all sorts of damage uh no question about this um right so they are serious issues and they need to be discussed and we're fans you know have suffered greatly throughout the years because of facilities like that and our own club have a few issues i think to sort out in terms of sanitation and in, in the toilets too so you know it's something we should mention uh, from Jamie Newton. Hello, Jamie. Uh, Forest Green Rovers score majority of goals in first 10 and last 10 minutes of the game. Is it concerning how slowly we've started games? How do we start better? James, this goes back to, I, I think we were all saying in the first half, how easy it was for Rovers to get back into their shape. You know, by the time that we took yeah. to get the ball from one end of the pitch to the other, it's very easy for the opposing side to say, right, let's just get in our shape and sit there and, you know, it's not that difficult. Uh, and we do tend to start games slowly, don't we? Yeah, we do. And I think, um, you know, everyone around me on Saturday was just saying, come on, get the ball forward more quickly. It was just too slow, uh, too agricultural. Um, and, you know, in the second half, when we when we did push it forward more quickly, look what happens. We go and score three goals. Well, OK, second one was a, you know, one of them was a penalty. But, you know, the last goal was a, was a good, good example. So, yeah, I agree with you, Vic. And there's a common theme, I think. One is we always seem to, sh this first half always seems to be um, very slow, um, maybe an extra pass, not getting the ball in the box quick enough, you know, going back, going back to the defenders and goalkeeper far too often rather than going forward. Um, and then the second half, you know, we seem to, we seem to kind of up the ante a bit and, you know, they obviously get a talking to from the manager at half time and largely, um, you know, we tend to push forward a bit more, a bit more quickly, but you know, he obviously favours the possession style of football, which is, you know, he, he, he goes on on about quite a lot. But I think the problem is you can have as much possession as you like. But if you, you know, if you play that very slow ball, it gives teams, like you said, enough time to to get back into their shape. And ultimately, you know, you struggle then to to um, to penetrate the opposite team. And I think, you know, the opposition, and that's largely what we found in the first half, really. So, yeah. I just wish they could, you know, the first half performances would mimic, mimic those second half performances a bit more and we would um, start a bit more on the front foot and get it forward a bit quicker. Yeah, I always remember that Premier League stat where um, uh, Liverpool had 95% possession, Bournemouth had yeah. five, but Bournemouth won the game. Well, exactly. Simple. Yeah, simple as that. And uh, do we start too slowly? Yeah, you know, it's it's almost like we're trying to get a measure of the opposition. And a few times Garner's come out uh, at the end of the game after a more positive second half and said oh you know we tweaked a few things and I kind of wonder what it is he does say that makes that change happen on Saturday I think purely and simply it was McCurdy um, yeah. but clearly if we start as slowly on uh, next Saturday as, as we did against Bristol Rovers we could well come a cropper um, and one interesting thing uh, that we, we're probably all aware of is that we have not yet been in a winning position at half time this season yeah. Mm. So if we start slowly Saturday, you've got a couple of very good strikers, 13 goals between them, who are going to hit us hard, I think. So we need to work out what we do to get in that second half mode. Uh, and maybe it is, maybe, you know, McCurdy starts and it'll be a little bit different. I think he adds energy to the game. Um, but we've got to, we've got, we've definitely got to come off the blocks fast Saturday. If yeah. we'd had a player on, we could have asked him what they said at half time. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to put that point in. Um, Rob, uh, do we start too slowly? One league goal in the first half all season. I think that probably tells the same story, doesn't it? Um, we don't, we it's almost as if it's a deliberate ploy, isn't it? I, Anna mentioned tr just trying to measure what the opposition have got. I think it's more a case of just trying to tie the opposition out, trying to pass the ball around them without really making it look as if they want to be threatened and then try and do something different in the second half to change the game. But there's a there's an element of making yourself solid, isn't there? There's an element of keeping yourself secure, particularly away from home, you think, rather than at home. Make sure you don't give away those early goals so that you're still in the game when 
maybe your game changers come on in the second period. I think it is more of a deliberate ploy than something necessarily that is just happening. I think we might see this continue for a, a good period. But the key thing there is don't do what we did on Saturday, give away an early goal. We've been very good at not doing that this season, generally speaking. Yeah. But you give away an early goal against a team who are top of the league and flying, and you're going to start to struggle. So I, I don't have quite the same issue with our first half performances, maybe as some, as long as what we see in the second half changes the game, as it did on Saturday. But you've got to stay in the game. That's the key thing. And you think back to last season, what were we not good at? Staying in the game. We were we were so far behind before we even got our foot in the hole in the game. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if you think back to Saturday's goal that we conceded, and one, I think it was at Stevenage, wasn't it? They were both... You know, just two players being caught napping, simple as that, really. And that's where those goals came from. So we have to say defensively, we've been pretty sound uh, so far this season. Um, right. Uh, it was not lost on McCurdy that if you get in and around the six-yard box, you're going to get a chance. His goal at Scunthorpe was similarly a rebound from a keeper. Is it too much to ask Simpson to be doing similar? I mean, I have to say the reactions to McCurdy to get that goal, James, were quite exceptional, weren't they? Because the rebound comes out from the keeper, he smacks it into the back of the net and, you know, he had to get in the right place to put that ball in the back of the net and put it in the net. It was, it was a great finish. So, as we said before, you get the ball in the six-yard box, you got a chance of scoring. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's kind of refer back to what I said earlier a little bit, really. When we're you know, when we're passing it back all the time and very slow and everything, you know, it doesn't it doesn't kind of give you that opportunity like we've just described that McCurdy kind of had. I think, you know, get the ball to him. And I think, you know, I mean, I think it, I think he did get more from, we got more from the game with him being in that position because their centre-backs and defenders were, how can I say it, slightly more um, immobile maybe than some of the um, <laughs> Leachy centre backs maybe we'd come across, and I think you know they they were scared, they were petrified of his pace basically, and the fact that he's you know he, 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 I don't think he's he knows what he's sometimes he knows what he's going to do next himself to some extent, um, and I think you know that's that's probably to some extent why you know maybe he's not as consistent um, as, as we'd like him to be, and why he's not started all games. But uh, yeah, I mean he was you know he, he changed the game, didn't he? Let's be honest. Um, I must say, going back to what Anna said earlier as well, I, I do think Gladwin had his best game on Saturday as well. Personally, I think um, you know, he, he, I think he he was definitely him and McCurdy for me were the um, you know were the two um, the two shining lights really. I think, um, but I think yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see. I think as Rob said earlier, if he starts on Saturday, what he does. Um, beginning of the season, he was quite good when he started um, a few games. Um, but then he kind of went off a little bit and obviously got injured and was on the subs bench and didn't really have the same kind of impact. So hopefully he's back to his full potential and fitness and, you know, we'll, we'll see the, the best of him if he starts on Saturday, hopefully. Yeah, so. uh, tr terrific. I, 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 I thought, well, I think he is becoming a cult figure as McCurdy and quite rightly, he's one of these players that Swindon fans take to, isn't he? And, um, you know, he's just as a box of frogs, I think it's fair to say, but he's great. You know, he's, it's just, you know, he's, he's a sort of player that, you know, if you were thinking, oh, this is a boring old game. If he suddenly comes on, you're thinking, hang on a minute, I'm going to stick around for this. This is, could be interesting. Um, this uh, Football is now like a game of chess. You have to drag the opponents out of position to create gaps, but you also need to make sure the opposition don't score in the first half. And that is an important point, Anna. I mean, I think we should say defensively, um, Dion Conroy was excellent on Saturday. Um, Critchlow was excellent. You know, defensively, we are pretty good at the minute, aren't we? Yeah, and I mean, last season, one of our failings, obviously, was <clears throat> the defence. But I've always been an advocate of saying we want to play securely defensively. So it's not just about the defence. You know, the ball over the top or the ball uh, that, that caught us out on Saturday, that was, uh, it was a one-off. Um, it didn't impact on the rest of our defensive performance. And we are closing players down all over the pitch, and that makes a massive difference. So you don't have the amount of pressure on the back four or back five as you had last season because you've got people mopping it up in midfield or intercepting it, stopping the cross. So, you know, defensively in general, we're much better. Uh, Saturday is going to be, again, completely different to, to Bristol Rovers because you've got a fast-paced side. They like possession as well. They've got a couple of big big blokes up front. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a really a really tough one, and we have to be 
sound as, as sound defensively as we were Saturday. Um, hopefully we'll start, I think we'll line up the same at the back, provided that Kessler Hayden is around. Well, that's and, the point um, I've got here. Is Kessler Hayden yeah, also missed on Saturday? Know, we? we don't know. <laughs> no. Right. Um, so I assume Rob Hunt would come in in that case, wouldn't he? So. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, defensively, Rob, we are better. I mean, you saw the games, well, most of the games last season live. We, you know, we had to watch it on the spinning white circle on iFollow. But, um, you know, it, it, defensively, we're, we're streets ahead of where we were this time last year. Oh, without doubt. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think there's a, there's a, a real tendency at the moment to focus so much on the defence. I'd also put Louis Reed in there. I think mm, this last, yeah. Certainly, these last three or four games, whilst Anthony Grant has been out of the gate, out of the team, he has really excelled. He's pushed himself forward, and it is that back five, as we say, when you put him in front of the back four, they have looked good. Ellis has his moments where he just wanders up the pitch, and he's not necessarily in position. A bit of work to be done there, I think, in terms of his overall defensive capabilities. But he also has been one of those players who's going to offer you an awful lot going forward as well. So you don't want to take that away from his game by just focusing him on as a, an out-and-out fullback. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you if I think back to last season, I, I, I lost count of the number of times in commentary we were saying Anne Swindon are behind again inside the first 15 minutes. And that's, that's just what it was. It felt like almost every game we were at, we were out of the game before it even started. And, and this time around, there is a, I'm sure there is a conscious decision to just try and be solid, not give anything away. Don't, don't really overcommit yourselves in the final third in those early exchanges. It doesn't make for great watching sometimes. It can be a bit tedious. You look at the half time and think what's actually happened. But if you get the performance like you got in the second half on Saturday more regularly, then people aren't going to complain about it. No, I think Lewis Reed is one of these lovely midfielder, midfielders who you don't necessarily notice, but I, I, you're right. Is it before? I mean, Colchester, I thought he was excellent, and mm. um, you know, Payne, of course, you can't fault because he's just everywhere, isn't he? Quite frankly. So let's turn to Saturday then. Um, it is a big game. They're top of the table, James. What are you hoping for? Um, oh, uh, KKH has been called up to the under twenties. Uh, we're, we're all a little bit confused by this situation, aren't we? I, um, so is that definite? So will he be missing? What, what's happening? It's all very confusing. We're having international players, isn't it? You know. Yeah. <laughs> so I assume Rob Hunt would come in if, if he doesn't play on Saturday. That would be the yeah, situation. I, I think so. I think, like, like we said earlier, I think he, you know, he was originally on the standby list and possibly wasn't going to be um, called up. But I think Anna mentioned that someone had become injured so naturally he's probably now been pulled into the full the full squad or what have you the full picture for uh, for the game so yeah it looks like that is the case then looks like we are going to miss him as well but um yeah I think Rob Hunt you know is a decent enough player I think just going back to the defense really really briefly I think one of the key things is um we all know from certainly the post interview since uh, Sheridan left you know a lot of that defense were playing certainly uh, Conroy was playing injured um, you know, a lot. Of, he was being forced to play basically through an injury last season, you know, and, and basically was being pressured and almost bullied to play, um, you know, and he wasn't right. And they didn't give him a chance to kind of recover. I think, you know, the fitness people we've got at the club now and the medical people, you know, they recognise that obviously, you know, he's got to be right. He's got to be fit. And, you know, he obviously is at the moment. So I think that's made a big difference. I mean, we don't we probably had a 60 or 70 percent Conroy last season in, in various for a lot of the games, so I think you know this season he's he's you know he's he's back to his old self and he looks um he looks exceptional really. So, but yeah, I think um I guess the the game on Saturday um given the number of people we've got missing, I'd be more than happy with a draw really. I think that would be you know they are they are a very very good team. You know literally they're um, they're rich and at the road from me. So when I can't get to an away game, um you know. I'll, I'll, I've been to watch them a couple of times. They're like 15 minutes away from my house, so um, it's quite. You can fun. always get in. Let's face it. You can well, exactly. There's no, there's no, never any problems getting in. Yeah, <laughs> but um, they are a very, very good team, and I think, as has already been said, you know, they've got a couple of very good goal scorers that are quite big. That is my worry slightly. We're quite a small team, um, and sometimes we do get bullied quite a lot. Um, so I think that'll be one of the key things: making sure we don't get bullied and. You know, because we've seen that a few times, certainly more so at the county ground, I think, um, and probably away. But 
I think as long as we can we can kind of handle that and we can play somewhere like we did on the weekend, I think we'll be okay. And I think we'll come away with a draw. Anna? Uh, yeah, I, I've had it in my head for a while that we're going to win 2-0. Um, but thinking about it, it's probably, more, it's probably more heart than head, to be honest. Coming off the back of Saturday's game, it's going to be a very tough one. Uh, they have lost at home before. They lost, as we did, to, to Port Vale. So... Um, but their the two goal scorers worry me quite a lot. And I don't think they're, I think they're going to look at us and go, let's have a real go first half. If we can, if we can hold it first half, then I think we're in with a shout, but it's going to be a tough one, especially with uh, the players we've got missing. Rob? Yeah. Keep the ball. The key for me, I have to say, keep the ball. Um, when you talk about a team that feed off um, two power strikers, they, they won't get the ball forward quite quickly, I'm sure. Jamil Matt's been in and around this division doing damage for many a year. So you know you're going to have problems trying to keep the ball out of your own net if you let them have the ball. So fundamental for us to keep the ball as much as possible on Saturday and, and try and ball them a little bit. Try and, You keep the ball. You just try and just pull them about, make sure that they come out trying to nick the ball back, open those spaces up. Harry McCurdy nips in in the 89th minute, win and win 1-0. That'll do. <laughs> Very nicely. And I can have several veggie burgers, so that'd be great. Thanks very much. <laughs> and uh, Anna, that, that is a Juliana Graziola type shirt, isn't it, if I remember right? Is that just a uh, shot from that era? It, it definitely is, yeah. I went a bit retro yeah. today. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, like it. Um, right, there we are. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. As we said, got a few problems with Facebook, but the, the thing has been recorded, so it should be on there, well, as soon as possible. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, that's certainly right. Um, I don't have a clue what's wrong. We have seven people that uh, certainly can watch it. So uh, thank you to them for the questions and everything. Um, it suddenly popped up on my Facebook and then went away again. So I don't know. I have no idea what's happening. So, um, But yes, if we have recorded it. So it will be um, up on YouTube and everything shortly. Lovely. Okay. Marvellous. Um, we should say next week, um, legendary goalkeeper Jimmy Allen uh, will be our guest on the sofa. So very much looking forward to that. The great Jimmy Allen, of course. Um, so he'll be joining us next Monday evening. He will. So we've got him next Monday. And then the following Monday, we've got another Monday night panel following the game versus Rochdale. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, apologies to everybody who's listened to it on record and couldn't log on. Um, don't blame us, blame Facebook. So, uh, but uh, we will all see you soon. Thank you very Rob. much and good night. Good night. Yeah.